If you clicked on this video, you probably have some old PC hardware laying around and you're trying to find a use for it. It could be an old PC, an old laptop or some old parts tucked away and collecting dust. Well, you've come to the right place, because in this video I'll show you how to set up your first home server. You can use your home server to create your own media server, to stream your favorite shows and movies to other devices. You can use it as a home surveillance system or as an NAS. You can even host your own VPN from it, or automate your home by using Home Assistant. The possibilities are practically endless, and it can run almost everything you tried running on your Raspberry Pi. It's 10 times cheaper than a Pi and about 100 to 1000 times more powerful. The only drawback is that it takes a bit more space and it draws a bit more power. I, for example, run my 3D print farm from such server. There are more than 10 3D printers and it's all handled by this old Xeon CPU, which was released back in 2007. I did some tests, and with all 3D printers running with input shaping, the CPU usage never went above 5%. I have 3 servers running at my office at the moment, and I'd like to start making videos about them. Before I can do that, I have to show you the basics. So, settle in and let's get started. Before starting with the server, let's quickly go over some things you'll need so you can prepare them before we begin. You will need your computer and an internet connection. I'll be installing Ubuntu server in this video. And to do so, you will need a USB stick with a capacity of 8GB or more. When the server is set up, we will access it remotely via SSH. So, it doesn't need to be connected to a keyboard, mouse and a monitor while it's running. For the first time setup though, these things will be needed, so we can change BIOS settings and get the operating system installed. I'll use a wireless keyboard and mouse combo with a capture card instead of a monitor, so I can record what's going on. Since all of my old computers are already running something, I didn't want to mess around with them. So I gave Facebook Marketplace a quick search and found this awesome system for only 20 euros. It came with a Gigabyte GA G41 motherboard, which supports Gigabit LAN out of the box, a Xeon E5430 CPU, 8 gigs of RAM, and a Radeon HD 6570 graphics card. It came with a hard drive and a DVD reader as well, and all of these components will be powerful enough to run all of the things I mentioned earlier. But there is one thing I would suggest you to upgrade, and that's the hard disk. I would swap it with an SSD because the performance difference is huge and the prices of SSDs have well dropped. I can get a 256GB SSD for around 25 euros and yes, I know that's more expensive than the whole system in my case, but again, the performance difference is huge. I'll be installing Ubuntu server on this machine. But before I get to the software, let's make sure this computer is set up and ready so we don't have to open it again later. I'll take most of the things out and give everything a good clean. First thing, the hard drive goes out and I won't be connecting the DVD reader back. I gave everything a good vacuum and I replace the thermal paste on the CPU. The RAM goes back in and since I won't be using this server for tasks which depend on the GPU, I'll swap it with a GT220, which should be less powerful than the one that came with the system. I did try running it without the GPU, but since this Xeon doesn't have an integrated one, the PC didn't boot. I swapped the hard disk with an SSD and the CD reader will remain disconnected since I'm not going to use it. This part is not needed at all, but since I'll be using a lot of USB devices from this machine, I got a PCI USB controller card with which I'll add another USB controller to this machine, giving me more USB bandwidth. And the last thing I'll be adding is a single 120mm fan to the side of the case, since I already had it on hand. I'll do some cable management, close the case, give it a wipe and the computer is finally ready. With our computer ready, the next thing to do is to install the operating system. As I mentioned earlier, I'll be installing Ubuntu server on this machine. And to do that, you will need to create an installation media in form of a USB stick or a CD. Since I don't live in a cave and my house is connected to electricity, I'll be using a USB stick. Go to ubuntu.com slash server slash download and download the Ubuntu server image. While it's downloading, we'll need to install a utility that's going to format our USB stick and turn it into a bootable USB drive. There are many options, but the easiest one is called Belina Etcher. So, go to the link below the video and download it. If you don't want to install it on your system, you can download the portable version, which will be able to run without you installing it on your computer. Get your USB stick and connect it to your computer. Open Belina Etcher and hopefully your Ubuntu server image has been downloaded by now. If it was, click on the flash from file button and select your ISO file. Then select your USB stick and please be careful to select the right one. And last thing, click flash and wait. The flashing process will start and now you'll have to wait a few minutes. I would suggest you to not touch anything until it's done. After it is finished, you can remove the USB stick from the computer and congratulations, because your bootable USB stick with Ubuntu server image is now ready to be inserted to your soon to become server. 
And after doing all of this, we are finally ready to make this machine an actual server. Plug in your keyboard, mouse and monitor along with the bootable USB stick. I'll be using a capture card instead of a monitor so I can record what's going on. Plug in the power, make sure the LAN cable is connected and flip the power switch to the on position. Before starting, let's briefly cover some of the things you'll need to know first. We'll be entering the BIOS, so please find out which key on your keyboard is used to do that. When you turn the computer on and when the post screen shows up, your BIOS key should be displayed somewhere on the screen. One more thing that may be useful is if your motherboard has a boot menu to quickly select the drive you want to boot from. So, after you found out which key gets you to the BIOS, start spamming it as soon as you turn the PC on. When you enter the BIOS, try to look for a power loss recovery option or something similar. What I'm trying to do here is to make the PC turn on automatically after a power loss. So if we ever lose electricity, the PC will turn on automatically when the electricity comes back. Next thing, let's go to the boot order settings and select the USB drive as the first boot option. Now you can save changes and exit the BIOS. The computer will reboot and show you the Ubuntu server grab menu. Select the try or install Ubuntu server option and wait for the installer to start up. On the first page, you can select your language and I'll select English. I'll check continue without update and now we have to select our keyboard layout. Since I'm using a Croatian keyboard, some letters are reversed compared to the standard one. So this step is very important for me. Luckily, there is an awesome tool that helps you do this. Select identify keyboard option and press the switch as it asks you. For the base for the installation, I'll choose Ubuntu server and here in the network connection section, just make sure an IP address has been assigned to your computer. I'll skip proxy and mirror address and now we have to select how to install our system on our drive. I'll be using the whole SSD drive, so I'll select use an entire disk and click done. Now it shows the system partitions and asks us to confirm and I'll select done once again. All of the data on this drive will be deleted, are you sure, click continue and now we can set up our profile. You can enter your name and the name of the server. Since this computer is the only one running a Xeon CPU, I'll name it Xeon so I know which one it is. Set your username and password and I don't want Ubuntu Pro, so I'll skip for now. Open SSH server will allow us to connect to this server from another device remotely and that will be the main way of accessing our server so make sure this is selected now the installer will ask us if we want to install some other services as well if this wasn't your first installation this would be very useful but for the first time let's leave it as is and click done and we are at the end of the installation now you'll need to wait for a few minutes for it to install everything and when it starts the updates i like to cancel them and do them manually later this cancelling update procedure always takes about 10 minutes so be patient and when it's done the pc will reboot after it does you will need to enter the BIOS once again. You can unplug your bootable USB drive from the computer and inside the BIOS you can select your HDD as the first boot option. Save changes, exit and wait for the Ubuntu server to boot. If everything went right you should be asked for your login credentials. If you are then everything is right and you can continue with the rest of the video. If this is your first time running something like this, you are probably wondering what to do now. The best way to start doing things is to start watching videos that show you how to install services like MotionEye, Jellyfin, Home Assistant and others. While playing around with your server, ChatGPT will be your best friend. Since whenever you need to do something simple like copying some files from one place to another, ChatGPT will give you the commands you need and it will help you figure it out quickly. We are going to start doing some pretty cool stuff soon, but just a quick reminder, if you enjoyed watching this video until this point, make sure to subscribe, since I'll be doing a lot more videos about this server in the future and I'm sure you'd like to check them out. The keyboard, mouse, which I haven't touched since I plugged it in, and the monitor are kinda getting in a way, so let's get remote access working. As shown earlier, we installed OpenSSH server and that's going to be used to remote access into this computer. First, let's check if our server is connected to the internet. Let's log in and type pinggoogle.com. You can see that I'm receiving packets, so my internet connection works. Now let's do a quick update of our repositories to make sure we are running the latest ones. It's always a good practice to do this before you make any changes to your system. So let's do it by typing sudo apt update. It may ask you for your password and after it's done, you will see the number of packets that can be upgraded. Now run sudo apt upgrade to install them all. While installing the OS, in the network section, we saw that this PC got a local IP address and this address will be needed to remote access into the server. Currently, this IP address may change when the PC or router reboots. If that does happen, you won't know your IP address and you'll have to log in into the router to check it again. So what we need to do is to set a static IP. We will have to edit some config files and it would be useful if we could copy some things over from our main PC. 
So I'll SSH into the server right now so I can use my clipboard. I'll log in into my router and it looks like the IP address of my new server is 192.168.0.16. Now we'll try to SSH into it. You can use a utility like Putty or simply do it from the command line by typing SSH, your username, at the IP address. Type yes and then type your password. And you can do the exact same thing from a Mac terminal as well. As you can see everything works and we've logged into our server from another device on the network. Now let's install Putty since it's my preferred way of doing it. Let's open it up and type our IP address once again. Click accept and type in your username and the password. To set up a static IP address, we'll have to modify our NetLand configuration file. We have to find out what's our network controller called and we need to decide which IP address we want to use. It has to be an available one and what I mean by that is that no other device is already using it. To find out what's your network interface called, we can use the ifconfig command. But before we can do that, we have to install NetTools. Type sudo apt install NetTools and after it's done, we can try running the if command once again. And you can see that my interface is called ENP3S0. Next thing, let's modify the netplan config file. You can use ls command to show what's inside the current directory. And you can use the cd command to change directory. Use cd space dot dot to go back, or cd followed by a path to which you want to go to move there. And you can use the clear command to clear everything that's currently on the screen. Our config file is located inside etsy slash netplan, and it will be a yaml file. We can edit it by using the sudo nano command, sudo nano and then type the file name. You can use tab to autofill it to the end. This is the sudo nano editor and we are inside the config file, but the thing I'd rather do is to backup this file before we make any changes. Press ctrl x to exit and let's rename it to yaml.bck as backup. We can use the mv command to achieve this. And you can see that I got an error, since my user doesn't have permission to rename root files. To give yourself root permission, I can type sudo i, and after doing so, you can see that the file name has been changed successfully. Now let's create a new file, which will be our actual config file. You can use the touch command to create a new file, and I'll name mine static.yaml. Now let's go inside it by again typing sudo nano, and then static.yaml. You can see that this file is currently blank, and I'll make sure to leave this command somewhere in the description so you can copy and paste it. I have to change the interface name, and and set the IP address to the one I want. Now I can copy it all and paste it into the config file by pressing the right mouse click. Press Ctrl X to exit, Y to save and enter to confirm. Now we can type sudo netplan apply to apply the config and I lost the connection to the server so something did happen, which is a good sign. I'll go back to the server and type sudo reboot to reboot the machine. Once it's back up, I'll go inside the router one more time and if I did everything right, the IP should be static this time, which it is. Now you can power off your machine by entering sudo power off, disconnect the keyboard and everything else, move it to its destination and power it back on. While editing this config file, you've learned how to change directories, how to list files, create files, rename them, edit them and much more. If there's something similar you need to do but you don't know which command to use, ask ChatGPT. I found it to be the fastest option when I'm trying to troubleshoot something. If you ever built a computer, you probably used hardware monitor to check the components, temperatures, etc. In Ubuntu you can install something called NeoFetch. Type sudo apt install NeoFetch and after it's done, you can run it by typing NeoFetch. You can see the OS version, the motherboard, kernel, uptime and much more. One more useful thing is htop. htop will allow you to check the current load of your CPU and memory. Install it the same way by typing sudo apt install htop. In my case it was already installed so I just had to run it by typing the htop command in the command line. Here you can see your CPU cores, the memory and the services that are currently running. Use ctrl c to exit out of it. And the last thing before I go, I'll show you how to access the files on your server from other devices on the network. I'll use an application called WinSCP, and sadly I couldn't find a good alternative on Mac. Go to the WinSCP website and download the installer. Open the application and again enter the IP, username and password. Click yes and you'll be inside your OS file system. I'll go inside home slash Bruno, which is my username, and I'll create a text file. Now I'll SSH into the server and try to find the file. As you can see, that's the file I just created, and in some cases it may be easier to use a client such as WinSCP to quickly edit or transfer a larger amount of files. I really hope I explained everything well and I can't wait to start doing more videos about home servers and services you can run on them. Please don't forget to subscribe if that's something you are interested in and if you have any questions or ideas don't forget to leave a comment down below. Thank you so much for watching till the end and I'll see you in the next one.